Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here, we would love to have you as part of the family. And in order to do that, all you have to do is hit that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all. That way you are reminded of every time a video is uploaded. If you are interested in becoming a subscriber, all that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to dive into today's stories, which means it is time to go back to ashes. So, sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Let's Not Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. So, I work in a restaurant, an irregular who comes in often, sometimes alone, and sometimes with his daughter, who is around my age, came in to pick up an order a few nights ago. He's always nice and very friendly and makes jokes when he's here, so I've never felt uncomfortable around him. He commented that I looked so different because I dyed my hair and had jewelry on. I told him, yeah, it was actually not supposed to be this color, but it is what it is, and went on about my day. Well, hours later, when we were cleaning up to close the restaurant, I see him sitting on the bench on the porch of the building, alone at 9 or 9.30 p.m. And since he's a regular and someone who I didn't consider creepy or a danger, I asked him if he was okay. He said, yeah. And I said, are you sure? Because I was confused as to why he was sitting there after he had already been here hours prior to pick up food. He said, yep, just waiting so we can talk for a few minutes. I laughed because I thought surely he was joking. And I went back inside. My coworker walked me out that night and I walked past really fast and said, have a good night. And he paused as if he was confused and said, Oh, mm, good night. I thought maybe I was overthinking it, but my coworker told me that he left right after I did. He came in the following day and was super oddly quiet and down while eating his food, according to my coworkers. I avoided eye contact and conversation the entire time he was there after saying the avoidable, How are you? My coworker took the table, and I tried my best to stay out of the dining room while he was there. But I'm concerned he's going to be waiting outside one day when we're not expecting it and try to hurt me or something worse. I was born in Moscow, Russia in the early 90s, but my brother was born in 1980, and this is his story. I had him write this to follow the rules and to get the best version for you. I was about seven to eight years old, and me along with my friends were the absolute biggest idiots in terms of doing stupid shit. We would make smoke bombs, fireworks, etc. out of whatever we found and did tons of other stupid shit. Russia in the late 80s resembled the most apocalyptic wasteland you see in movies in a lot of places, mainly because there was really no law and order, so no one cared. You were able to buy crazy things off the streets. My father was once offered an old rocket launcher. Yeah, that part. With this, parents often just let their kids fuck around in those places, so we would be doing stupid shit in those abandoned buildings. Well, one day we were messing about when one of my friends noticed something lurking nearby. We didn't really care. We were used to seeing weird shit anyway, but after a bit we noticed the person was not really moving. They just stood there. When he noticed we had seen him, the man slowly walked into view. A large, bald man, black coat, a nice one, likely an import, which was expensive at the time, 
and American sneakers, also very expensive. He didn't really greet us or anything, but he must have seen me looking at his shoes because he just said, Like my shoes? I have more if you want them. Come on. Now, a few things really unnerved us, any of us, but this dude definitely did. If you know anything about Russia in that era, this dude looked like someone you did not want to fuck with. The kicker, though, once he turned around, my friend noticed he had a gun in his pants. The second he saw that, he yelled, GUN, and booked it, and we all just scattered. I just heard the guy curse loudly and did not see him again. Now, if the story ended here, it would have just been a creepy encounter. But sometime later, we were no longer allowed to play in that area. I found out much later that they had found another child beaten to death with a rock in that building shortly after our experience. To be honest, as a kid, I never really thought much about this until my parents told me about the death, at which point the dots connected and I realized what we potentially ran away from. Hello. So, I'm afraid of roads at 21 from an encounter eight or more years ago. I'm not sure if gender matters, but I am female. Now this might sound maybe a tad bit over dramatic since it's been years since this incident has happened that caused this fear, but I just want to get it off my chest as someone who doesn't really talk about it. I personally find this encounter super creepy, especially getting older and being able to look back on it. I've learned a lot from it, so maybe posting what happened could either guide others to stay alert or that it could happen to them, or know the signs. I live in rural Ohio, so there's not much that goes on here. We don't live in the best area either, with lots of druggies and pedos. Just if you have kids, you really shouldn't live around here, basically. When I was younger, we didn't really worry much about anything happening to us or questionable things due to the fact our family is known in this area. My grandpa was a known cop for many years and was extremely respected, and people knew he would fight over us. So nobody really messed with us. We also lived with multiple other children our age. It wasn't uncommon to let your kids run around by themselves before nighttime because our neighborhood essentially relied on each other and other kids to keep each other safe and it worked for the most part. We knew what people to stay away from and they knew to stay away from us as well. When I was in middle school, the bus ran at 7 a.m. and we would have to be at the end of our long driveway by 7 a.m. to catch the bus on time. And this happened during winter, and our bus tended to be late sometimes, and would reach us at around 7.05 or 7.15, the latest. But we made sure to be out at 7 a.m. in case there were on time. It was me and my two cousins, one of four years younger than me, and the other two a year older, but we were the same grade. The road is straight where our driveway is, so cars come by multiple times, and you would be able to see if a car was slowing down and such, and they'd see us as well. We were always told not to stand at the end of the driveway and always keep a distance so if a drunk driver or whatever happened to swerve, we would be okay for the most part. We were at the edge where me and my cousin, who was in the same grade as me, essentially babysat the younger cousin, and we didn't have an adult accompany us at the end of the driveway anymore. It was super cold that day, and the sun was just coming up, and we were annoyed because the bus was late while waiting in the cold. I noticed the car was coming, and again, this happened all the time, so it wasn't like I was checking it out or anything. I just noticed it and went back to listening to my music on my phone. 
I hear a loud brake sound, so I look up, and the car is in front of our driveway, now fully stopped. The man in the car was waving his hand towards us to signal us to come closer to him. And, of course, I refused and was frozen in my spot, because this never happened before. He could tell we were obviously shaken back by this and said he worked for a school, but he was lost and he just got hired. He named a school that was an hour away. Remind you, it's past 7 a.m. at this point, and I immediately knew he was lying. It didn't make sense to me why he would be lost at a job he said he already got, plus it being this late, I think he would already be at the school. No way would he be lost to the point he's an hour away from the district and signaling children to his car the way he did if he was a teacher at all. It also made no sense to me logically how he could be lost from a job he previously had to go in to get hired for. This was before Zoom and all those things, I'm pretty sure. I immediately said, I'm going to get an adult, and he clearly panicked and said it wasn't necessary, that he just wanted to get closer and show him where to go. I pointed straight. I truly don't know the direction to the district, but that was not my main focus, honestly. I told him to go straight, and he ignored me. My little cousin was moving towards the car, and I grabbed him by his hair and kept him by me. I refused to let go of his head. I'm shaking, and I'm trying to not show I'm scared because I don't know what's about to happen. The driveway is a long one as well, like I truly don't feel safe turning my back to him. I have my other hand on my phone, and I'm shaking, so I'm struggling with gloves on, but I'm able to call my mom, and thank God she answers. She usually would ignore my calls and be on the phone with her boyfriend. The guy gets out of his car when he sees I'm on the phone with someone, and I start immediately sobbing and telling my mom there's a man out here, and I think he's going to hurt us. She comes out running, and the second she gets closer and he sees her, he bolts back to his car and dashes away. A car that was around the corner of the road also dashed away as well. Now looking back, is even more scary since it was just someone who needed to get past said car that was in the middle of the road by our driveway. They could have just either honked or gone around the other lane to pass them. They definitely also saw the entire thing and didn't get out of their car to help us or anything. So, it makes me think they were also in on the entire situation. I'm forced to go to school that day, and my mom calls the cops. And when I get home, I find out even more horrible news that just made me realize my gut feeling was correct. My mom told them the car and how it looked and such, and they found an abandoned car that matched her description just up the road, so they found who it belonged to and eventually found out it wasn't a school teacher. He worked on the barges. The cops said they thought it dealt with sex trafficking from the looks of it, and they didn't even catch him since they already left on the boat or whatever. Who knows what would have happened if he got one of us. I'm assuming we would have been on that boat and horrible things would have happened. It still pisses me off that he was never caught and possibly other kids were victims of this. It's truly terrifying and to this day, I refuse to go near the road. I still have reoccurring nightmares of it. I'm always on alert now too which I most definitely should have been more alert back then. But I was just a kid and clearly didn't realize how it would have affected me in real time. So, to the creepy, possible sex trafficking guy that I ran into, I hope that was the last time I ever see you again. This happened this Saturday, two days ago. 
I'm a 19-year-old freshman at uni who moved from a fairly small town to a big city. There was a guy I'd talked to over Tinder for around two weeks. He was cute and seemed nice. We had a lot in common. He even studied at the same university. He was older, though. He already had a degree and was now doing postgrad. The first time we ever met, we went out to grab a coffee on Monday, exactly a week ago. I had a great time, and when he asked me if I'd like to get drinks, drinking eight tears, 18, by the way, on Saturday, I happily said yes. We met up at a local bar and talked without a moment of awkwardness for two hours. We really clicked. I had to go to the bathroom, and when I came back, a man was waiting for me outside the toilet. He stopped me and told me the guy sitting at my table put something in my drink and asked if I wanted him to call the police. I thanked him but said no, everything's fine, and went back to my table. I really liked the guy and wanted to believe that the random man was just pranking me. Still, I wasn't willing to risk it, so I told him directly what happened. I said, Um, I'm sorry, this sounds insane, but... After I got out of the bathroom, some random guy told me you put something in my drink. He laughed and said that's insane, as if we were giggling at the same situation together. He wasn't serious about it at all. I apologized and said I don't think he did that, not at all, but I'd be much more at peace if he chugged my drink just so I'd know the random guy was pranking me, because... Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I apologized again and said the drinks are on me, and I'm very sorry to make the situation awkward. He said that's absolutely not a problem. He just had to go pee first. I waited. After 15 minutes, I realized he's not coming back. I waited around for a bit longer, and after half an hour, I paid and went home. Upon getting home, I checked my Tinder and saw he deleted his account. Okay, maybe he thought I'm so insane our date made him delete the app. Still, it bothered me. I googled him and found nothing. Today, I went to the records office at my uni and asked if a person with his name was studying there. The lady working there told me that's private information she can't share. I then asked if a person with his name has ever obtained a degree from this university. She looked it up and told me that no, no one with that name has ever obtained a degree there. He lied to me. He told me he did his undergraduate degree at my uni. He hasn't. Or alternatively, he told me a fake name. I'm now sure he had terrible intentions and did spike my drink. I was more than lucky that someone noticed. I have no idea what he'd do to me had I drank that, and I don't really want to know. I'm still a bit creeped out about the situation. I did delete Tinder, and I'm very glad I didn't give him my phone number or my address. He did offer to pick me up, and I cleverly said no yet dumbly told him that the coffee place we met up at is walking distance from my apartment, so he knows the area I live in, as well as my first and last name and where I study. I don't think there's anything I can do about it, though. I seriously doubt he even gave me his real name. To the random tender guy who lied to me and probably tried to drug me, let's not meet and to the kind guy who made me aware of the situation. Thank you very, very much. I'm a 29-year-old man from the Philippines, and even though this incident occurred back in 2013, over a decade ago, I still find myself haunted by it every time I return to my hometown. At the time, I was just an 18-year-old college student. It was our department's socialization party, which had wrapped up around midnight. As the only one among my friends with a car, I had always taken on the role of the designated driver. 
After dropping my friends off at their homes, I was parking in my usual spot, just a few houses away from my own due to the limited parking in the area. As I was about to exit the car, I noticed a girl standing near the entrance of my alleyway leading to my house and several others wearing a shirt with our department's logo. I assumed she had just walked back from the party. In front of her, a man in his late 20s, clad in a hoodie, stood ominously, seemingly blocking her path. The girl locked eyes with me, and I immediately recognized her expression. It was a silent plea for help. Instinct kicked in. I grabbed my bag and stepped out of the car. The man noticed my presence, began to walk into the alleyway. When I reached the girl, he had vanished from sight. It felt as though whatever threatening situation had occurred moments before was over, and I was tempted to walk away. But then I caught sight of the strange man again. He was leaning against the wall of a nearby house, his gaze fixed on me. A chill ran down my spine, and just then, the girl called out from behind me. Her voice trembled with fear, and I saw her approach visibly shaken. Can, can you walk me to my apartment at the end of the alleyway? She asked, explaining that the man had been silently blocking her way. I glanced back at the man. He appeared intoxicated, perhaps drunk or on drugs. We began to walk, our breaths shallow, as we passed him. After putting some distance between us, I glanced back. To my horror, he was following us. We had already passed my house at this point, but I couldn't leave this girl to face him alone. As fear coursed through me, she suddenly broke into a full sprint, and I had no choice but to keep pace with her. We reached the gate of her apartment, and she hastily swung it open, slamming it shut behind her. We then dashed into the building where a second gate stood, the one smaller, likely designed to keep pets from escaping. She opened it, and we slipped through, just as the sound of the man approaching the first gate reaching our ears. We bolted up the stairs, making our way to the third floor. Breathless, the girl knocked urgently but softly at her apartment door. After what felt like an eternity, it swung open, revealing her friends, a guy and a girl around her age. They looked bewildered but quickly locked the door behind us and led us into the bedroom. They turned off the lights and we just sat there silently with our hearts pounding. The girl broke down in tears, recounting the terrifying events to her friends. She revealed that the man had been following her for 10 to 15 minutes, and she expressed relief at having seen me. Unsure of what to do next, I called my aunt, who was staying at our house that night. Thankfully, she answered swiftly. I urged her to call the police. At this time, we could now hear the man pacing around the apartment, seemingly looking for us. He was mumbling something we couldn't hear well from the other side of the door. A few minutes later, my phone rang with an unknown number. It was my uncle, a policeman, reassuring me that help was on the way. What felt like hours dragged on, and eventually the police arrived. My uncle instructed me via phone to come downstairs and recount the ordeal to the officers. They informed us that they had seen the man wandering around the gate and eventually into the far end of the alleyway. Once the police had finished their inquiries, they allowed me to go home. I recounted the entire story to my aunt, who urged me to get some rest. Despite my exhaustion, sleep eluded me as my mind raced with thoughts of that strange man. What if he had caught up with us, armed with a knife or some other weapon? I fought to dispel the terrifying images racing through my mind, but I couldn't shake the feeling that he might be watching me in the dark. A knife glinting 
menacingly in his hand. I was 16, and I had met this kid down the street from my house. He said he saw me around and we should hang out. I figured why not. So I gave him my number and told him to hit me up. The next week comes around and I get a text from him asking if I wanted to play basketball. Of course I did. He asked if I smoked weed. I did, and asked me to bring some, which isn't out of the ordinary for teenagers. I brought a couple friends, since we were going to play sports. To be honest, I was really fucking stoned by the time I got there. It was a little out of our neighborhood, but it wasn't a bad hood, so I wasn't bothered. I was an idiot. It was a gang who ambushed us as soon as we got out of the car. They violently beat me and my two friends, and I got it the worst. There were three of them on each of us. They stabbed my best friend, not very bad. They choked me unconscious, held a gun to my head and pistol whipped me. They ran my pockets and got my cell phone and wallet. I swear at one point I actually died because I literally shit myself when I went unconscious. I was drenched in my own blood. My nose was broken, both eyes swelled shut later. They had to wake me up because I drove a stick shift and nobody could drive my car. My attacker literally had to resuscitate me in order for me to leave. I stopped at a gas station because I had shit in my pants and I couldn't see with blood in my eyes. As soon as I got in, the clerk's jaw dropped. Where's the bathroom? I said. He pointed the way. I cleaned up the best I could, then drove home. I got home, called the cops, and showered. The cops obviously thought it was my fault for being an idiot. Nonetheless, an undercover showed up and knew exactly who robbed me because we lived on the same street two blocks apart. Turns out, they had turned him informant, and he reneged on the deal and robbed the buyers in the controlled buy. I told them how violently they were and swore they would kill someone. I did a photo lineup, but they all looked the same to me, so no case. Two months later, the cop knocked on my door. My mother was super pro-cop and told them I was asleep in my room and turned them loose on me. They woke me up and held a photo and said, Who's this? How would I know? I'm, I've never seen that person before. You called this person from your cell phone. The cell phone that I reported stolen in a violent robbery to the police? They both looked stunned and, of course, stupid. They beat me almost to death. You should probably go read that police report. They apologized and explained that my cell phone had been used to set up a robbery and the person in the photo had been shot to death. I told you guys they would kill the next guy. They came in blazing glory and left in shame. I have PTSD now and have kept tabs on my assailant for 17 years. I have no ability to trust anyone, not even those closest to me. So, to the ones who scarred me for life, let's not ever meet again. Caught a cab with my three-year-old son today, going to preschool, but for a coffee at our local first. Cabby was a greasy-looking 50 to 60-year-old Caucasian male with slick back white hair, balding at crown hair, and a beer gut. Not that physical appearances necessarily matter, but perhaps they do add context. It was a short drive, as aforementioned, to preschool or eight minutes, I think. Within the first couple of minutes, he was talking about the haughty Margaret Robbie, who I've been compared to looking like before. And then we passed a cop car, and he's like, 
bloody cops. I proceeded to ask him if he didn't like cops, and he kind of stumbled over why and pointed out basically how they do their job and sit on the radar gun at the specific spot. Methamphetamine was mentioned at one point, but I kind of blanked on exact conversation because all I'm thinking is his vibe is really weird. He won't stop talking and from the first conversation about Margaret Robbie being hot, I was going to be happy for a cab ride to be over here. He went to pull into the car space that was obviously way too small for this big man that he's driving. And I actually had to say, look, I don't want to obstruct traffic. And he kind of angrily muttered something about the trees being in the way and aggressively pulled out and into a bigger space farther up. After I've paid, he's unbuckled his seatbelt and got out and said, do you mind if I caffeinate with you? I was legit so shocked at his braziness. I'm with my son and have places to be that I kind of just mumbled and okay. He proceeds to follow me into the coffee store. He starts to say something about a nude model on the beach. And luckily the attendant interjects asking if he'd like to place an order. So I get out of hearing whatever was going to follow on from that statement. I ordered my coffee and head straight down to the back of the store where they have an enclosed play area for my toddler while I wait for coffee. He orders and follows me down and excuses himself to make some room. Gross. One of the attendants comes down with his coffee and asks if she should put his there. I look at her exasperated and I said, well, I don't know. He's, <laughs> he's not with me. And she said, oh, I thought you were together. I said, no, no, mm -mm. he's my cab driver and I don't know him. This is weird, isn't it? She looked really confused, confronted and then concerned and was amazing and said, if you need any help, let one of us know and we'll get the owner. So anyways, he comes out at least 10 minutes later, but very shortly after the coffees arrived and I'm packing up my son to leave to work, to preschool and daycare. It's literally a two minute walk away. And I mention I'm heading off. He asks if he can give me a ride up to the preschool. No, no, it's fine. It's a short walk. He tries to insist. And then I insist. No, thank you. It's a nice walk. Then he asks, what time am I coming back? I am reluctant to give any details by now, so I just say, I'm not sure. And he continues to probe as to whether it'll be around an hour. And if so, he could call the office and see if he could wait up for me. In the politest of ways, I say, hell to the no. And I'll be a few hours at least. Which wasn't a lie. I was going to be there exactly, but didn't want him to know. I ended up feeling so out of sorts, the behavior that I filed a complaint with the taxi company. My husband went looking for this taxi, being a small town. He was ropeable, but luckily didn't find him. I appreciated his velour, though. I now feel confused about whether my gut feeling on this guy was correct and kind of scared because he knows where we live, which is on a property with no neighbors, closed by, and no husband home during the day. Do you all think I'm overreacting, or is this guy truly a stalkerish creep? Meet Jane. I don't know much about Jane except that she's from a small town and she's here with her friends and boyfriend for university. When I first met Jane at the pub, I thought she hated my guts. She also gave me nasty looks and when my friends tried to approach her friends, she'd be rude to me. Jane is pretty, like very, very pretty. Like every guy in town has a thing for her. But Jane's boyfriend is insane, to say the least. 
They are regulars at the pub, and I've seen them break up around three to four times. And the waiter working at the pub, guy is in my friend group, says he's noticed them break up a dozen times more, but they always come back together. Couple months back, I had just finished with the gym and I had just showered when my mom called and asked about this pub and how's the food there. I told her the foods to die for and she said she and my stepdad were on their way there. I told them I would meet them too because I was dying for some hot wings and a burger. We sit down and me and my dad just started drinking beer after beer and in no time, I was downed five pints of beer. I was getting a little bit tipsy, but I kept pushing though. My dear friend, let's just call her Tina, called and asked if I was down for a drink. I told her to come to the pub as I was already there. She's gonna meet my folks and that, and they planned on leaving soon so she and I could continue. That's how it happened. My parents left and Tina and I continued drinking on our own. The pub was closing, so Tina decided to go to the bathroom, and I walked with her inside to see if I could get another pint. We stumble upon Jane. Jane starts talking to Tina, and I realize they know each other. We all sit down to comfort her as she was a crying mess. Her boyfriend and she were done for good. She revealed that he used to really abuse her, mentally and physically. I felt bad for her, so when she rested on my shoulder, I let her. Tomorrow night, I get a DM from her, and she's apologizing about the trauma dumping. I tell her it's no biggie, as we've all needed to vent to someone sometimes. Albeit, I do that to my therapist, not strangers, but whatever. The therapist is a stranger I pay. We continue chatting and she constantly goes between I can't text you and then texting me again. Don't text me and text me first when I don't. Keep in mind, this is like two days since that interaction. One drunken night, she texted me to meet her. It was around 2 a.m. and I had my little cousin over. That whole night, we watched movies and had just fallen asleep. So, I declined her offer. Also... I feel it a bit weird for me to hang out with her completely sober while she can barely see. I don't know. It was just weird to me. The next day, she'd sober up, and I agreed to meet her for a hangout. We hung out for a while, and she was fun to hang out with. I really did like her and worry about her and her ex. Soon enough, her leech of an ex left town as he was never really interested in uni, just being close to her. On one of our dates, she revealed to me that she realized she had feelings for me, and that's when she broke up with her ex, resulting in him physically attacking her. One day, we had a date at her place, a little study date. After we finished studying, we relaxed on the couch and ended up making out. We didn't have sex that night, but I did finger her. I went home and we continued talking about it, even exchanging photos. My first and only time sending a nude, and then we hooked up. Now, I'm a person who likes alone time, so sometimes I just want to chill in my house and not really be with anyone. And she did not like this idea. She started spamming me with calls, saying how she could come over and we could just chill. She will be silent and I'll still be alone. In my opinion, this kind of defeats the idea of being alone as I'm not fucking alone. She threatened me that night that I didn't pick up the phone. She would never talk to me again. This is where I snapped and told her that lukewarm at best manipulation tactics would not work on me and to not contact me again. She flipped out and came to my part of town, hanging out and waiting for me to come out. I told her, I begged her millions of times not to come to my house, but she simply said, nah, I'll pass, and came anyway. 
I literally felt so disrespected because all of a sudden, I hold no value in life. When she texted me, Come out, I'm right here. I texted her, Nah, I'll pass and stay home. Now she's following me everywhere I go. It's been months and I'm dating the girl of my dreams. But that has not stopped her from being in my shadow. She learned my routine. When do I go to the gym? When I'm at practice, etc. And she never fails to show up or drive past where I'm at. My stepbrother revealed the security footage of our house, and we counted her car driving past my house at least 14 times a day. I still get texts from her on the daily, even though she's blocked. She gets wasted and spams me with messages on WhatsApp that she then deletes. My girlfriend is absolutely livid with this chick, as she would not leave me the fuck alone. I do not fear for my life, but I have warned my friends that if I die, it would be in an accident or a suicide. She's in my shadow. I constantly have to check my six to see if she is behind me. So, to my weird psycho ex, now stalker girlfriend, leave me the fuck alone. You hear stories about people unknowingly squatting in other people's homes, but never think in the world it would happen to you. Well, it happened to me. About 10 years ago, I was living alone in a two-family house on the second floor with my then toddler. For the story to make sense, I need to try and explain the layout of the back story. My brother's close friend at the time lived on the first floor and is the one who referred me to the landlord. We had private front entrances, but a shared back entrance with a staircase that ran from the basement all the way to the second floor. I would frequently leave my back door unlocked because I had a habit of locking my keys in the house, and my downstairs neighbor could let me in the back door. The downstairs neighbor had a friend who was kind of down and out. He had a history of substance abuse, but was supposedly clean at the time. He was a relatively nice guy, and my neighbor had been letting him stay on his couch for a while. The neighbor had a four-year-old daughter, and having someone constantly sleeping on the couch without any plans of finding a permanent living situation was becoming disruptive to their everyday lives. Neighbor tells them he needs to go. It was summertime, so the friend decides he's going to sleep on the couch on our covered porch. We then tell him that's not acceptable. And when we asked him to leave, we meant the property in general. It had also become abundantly clear that he was using again, and his behavior had become somewhat erratic. He was also making a lot of unsolicited advances on me, which had become increasingly uncomfortable. He wasn't happy, but it wasn't our problem. He stopped coming around, and we no longer saw him around town. Fast forward a month or two, and I noticed things going missing. Jewelry, small amounts of money left around the house, lighters, and consequential items I had written off as lost. This house was old, with paper-thin walls. The back door in question was right next to the bathroom, along one side of the shower. It also made a very distinct noise when opened. One day, my car was at the mechanic, so it probably appeared that I wasn't home. I'm showering, and I swear I hear the back door open. I freeze, practically, stop breathing after a few minutes, when somebody murdered me, American psycho style. I wrote it off. I'm a notorious wimp and had a history since childhood of thinking every strange noise was a potential murderer. This was a long time ago, so I don't remember the exact length of time, possibly a few weeks. The basement was really big and shared, and the landlord also stored stuff down there. It was very packed with some very dark corners. We rarely went down there. The landlord comes by one day and goes down to the basement. He hears a strange noise, 
grabs a baseball bat and finds this man in our basement. The man pushed the landlord down, runs out of the house and down the street. We call the police who find the man hiding in a trash can around the corner. Can't make this shit up. Upon further investigation, we found the basement window had been ever so slightly popped open. In the back corner behind some boxes was a nest of blankets filled with our missing items, plus some drug paraphernalia. It reminded me of Creature's Nest under the stairs at Grimmauld Place, if you know you know. He had also left his flip phone behind in the chaos where we found a lot of pictures of me sleeping. This man had been high on crack, living in our basement, and regularly entering my apartment, both when I wasn't home and when I was sleeping for months. While he seemed like a nice guy, he was regularly high on hard drugs and that changes people. I still get chills knowing he could have done anything to me and my child, and I would have never seen it coming. The worst part is that the charges somehow got dropped, and they never even consulted us, and they never gave us an option as the victims. This was not even close to his first criminal offense. My state is notoriously soft on nonviolent criminals, regardless of whether it was a victimless crime or not. My local police department is also notorious for making deals in exchange for information on even small-time dealers. We don't get any justice. Luckily, this didn't have much lasting effect on my mental health. Just more of a what the fuck, can't believe that really happened. It feels like a fever dream. Oh, and Jason, let's not ever meet again. I'm a 29-year-old woman. I live in a big city all my life. But at the beginning of April, I moved to a medium-sized town, about an hour away from that big city along with my sister and our four pets. This happened after a month of living there. My sister was preparing her final presentation for her arts undergraduate, which was going to be shown in the city. So she had to spend the whole day there to make her preparations. I was left home alone with our cats and dogs. So in the early evening, I decided to go for a long walk with my two dogs. We walked for like an hour, but about five away from our house, as we were heading back, I saw a man knocking on a door about a block away. I thought he looked a bit weird because he would knock on the door, look around, then knock on the door, and then look around again. But he didn't look dangerous, so I just kept walking since I had to pass by him to take the street that would take me to my home. When I was about 10 meters away, he looked my way and started walking towards me. He was tall and slender and was carrying what looked like a box of candy. He asked me if I had any coins to spare. I told him, Sorry, mate, I only have my dogs, poop bags, so have a good one. And I was ready to keep walking when he saw one of my tattoos and stopped me. For some context, I have tattoos. I'm not heavily tattooed. But I have several in my arm and legs, and since I am wearing shorts, the ones on my legs were visible. The specific one he was looking at of was a ghost woman in a traditional Japanese style. As he stopped me, he said, That's a really cool tattoo. Would you give it to me? I just laughed uncomfortably, thinking he was joking, but he was dead serious just staring unblinking at my tattoo. He then continued talking. No, so you're not just going to let the maggots eat it? Such a shame. It would be better if a person ate it. At this point, he raised his face and looked me straight in my eyes with a very flat smile that seemed to be an attempt to be friendly, but only made me feel even more uncomfortable. He then asked me for my name, 
and not wanting to antagonize him, I gave him a fake one. Let's say it was Regina. He then asked me if I lived in town, to which I also lied and said that I was from a big city and just visiting. He then told me he used to live in that city too. He lived on the streets downtown. He told me he used to rap in buses to get money and just out of the blue started rapping about me, still looking me straight in the eye. He rapped about how I was very pretty, how amazing my tattoos are, and in his rap, he said my name was Lorena. I corrected him and said my name was Regina, not Lorena. Since I had a suspicion, he realized I had given him a fake name and was testing me. He just smiled and nodded. He then asked me if I'd give him my number. I said that me and my dogs had to go home, that we were expected. He pointed at a butcher shop a block away and told me that we could sit over there a while. I gave him my number, that it wouldn't take long, but I told him that I couldn't, that the one waiting for me at home was my boyfriend, but I was lying again. Since I was home alone, his smile faded a bit and he just said, well, that sucks. I wished him a good evening only for him to drop to his knees and grab my leg with both of his hands. He started caressing my tattoo while whispering, it really is a goddamn cool tattoo. My dogs are pretty friendly and they were very calm during this entire exchange. But when he grabbed my leg, they started growling. I pulled my leg out of his hand, wished him a good evening again and just walked away as fast as I could. I took a longer way home to make sure he didn't follow me, and once home, I took a shower and scrubbed my leg really well, since I just felt very gross after that. Luckily for me, I haven't seen him again, but for a while after that, I made sure to cover my tattoos every time I went outside, just in case. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, creepy, let's not encounters. Before I go any further, I would like to take this time and acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Words still cannot express my gratitude and love for each and every one of you that stick around and remain the pillars of which this channel stands. Thank you so much. To the subscribers, or for the first timers, or for the ones that peekaboo into the channel, thank you so much for your support. For without you, I would not have a voice and there would not be a back to ashes. I appreciate your continued support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay careful out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.